Ken Brown from Cadline. I'm going to run through part of the technical presentation. Can you not hear me? Sorry, guys. Can you turn us up a little? I can't do it. Can you turn us up? Yeah. Cool. Can you hear me now? Guys in the back, yeah? Excellent. So, Nigel Briggs is with me. He's one of our customers. And um, we're going to look at sort of some real world simulation using one of his products inside of Fusion 360. So, this is our class overview, which is the bit we sold you so that you'd come to the class. Uh, just looking at some real world uh, simulation capabilities inside of the software. It's sort of a general overview. We're going to run through from start to finish. I'm going to ask that you try and keep your questions to the end. We're telling a bit of a story of using the software and actually looking at how we've optimized the product. So hopefully it'll all tie up and work nicely end to end. But if there are any questions, find them off at the end. That would be great. OK, a um, bit about me. I was lazy when I did my slides. I presented a similar class in, at AU in 2013. So I just nicked the slide. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Clint Cadline. Um, there's a link to my blog in the slides as well. Um, I come from a, an engineering background. I've worked in the motor industry, uh, rotating machinery, loads of plastic stuff, and a little bit of refrigeration, which was rather boring. Um, we'll move on to Nigel. Love to move. Uh, we're a group of um, engineering consultants, all multidisciplined from uh, various disciplines. Most of the work that I undertake is mechanical design, finite element analysis, and uh, product life cycle and that sort of thing as well. Typical example of work is um, the Doha Stadium, which was built for the World Cup bid for 2022. Uh, we designed most of the roof and got involved in um, getting that manufactured and installed on site as well. Uh, again, another typical products going around the screen is 19-inch racking systems, um, small injection mouldings. Uh, vacuum castings, um, parts for oil rigs, which you can see across the bottom there as well. And more recently, we've been involved in a whole range of Autodesk products with Samsung out in Korea on the Exodus project. This is the largest oil rig that's ever been built in the world. It's 110 meters square, and we were involved in building all the framework and the rise of protection netting, which you can see goes around the front of the structure there. So not only are we working through AutoCAD, also through uh, Navisworks and uh, Inventor and Fusion as well. So it's a completely collaborative program, the whole project being managed by Samsung Heavy Industries out in Korea. Okay. Yep. All right, so we've put up the learning objectives for the course. The idea is that uh, you'll learn about creating simulations, assigning materials, constraints and loads, and a bit about interpreting your results. I'm going to run, run through a couple of examples, and a lot of them you're going to sort of see my thoughts going into something, and there's a bit of failure. And yeah, I've done something, and that didn't go so well, so I've tried again. But I've tried to show you my thought process of running through simulations. Now, they're my thought processes, so you might think, oh, I would have done that differently, and that's perfectly fine. But hopefully, by the end of this, you'll get an idea of a logical approach to setting up a simulation and interpreting the, res the results. I always put this disclaimer up. Guys, we're simulating reality here. So we're going to simulate a component. We're going to simulate its real-world constraints, its material, and the way we're going to apply loads to it. So just bear in mind that everything you're doing on a PC has to have some bearing back to the real world. So if you're doing simulations back at work and you know that something snaps in half when you apply X load to it, make sure that when you do your simulations that you can try and make that same thing happen so that you sort of have a parallel between a simulation and the real world. Um, I get very nervous when people sort of throw things into software, nothing goes red, they go, everything's fine, and then something breaks. So, you know, you're responsible for your simulations. The software has to have inputs from you. You've got to drive it, and just bear that in mind when you go through it. Okay, so what are we going to cover in this session? Just after we wrote the first slide deck, Autodesk changed some of the tools inside of Fusion. Fusion being cloud-based is awesome. Every month there's a new update. Uh, so there was an update on the 30th of May and an update on the 20th of June. So there's a few new things in the software since we've done this. Um, but we are only covering static stress, so bit we've highlighted there in green. Uh, there is a, a bit of shape optimization inside of here. We're not going to cover that, but I believe there's a class earlier today. Did, it, did anyone go to the shape optimization class? Cool. Okay. We're going to show you a little bit of that. Um, we're not going to have time to cover all of the others, unfortunately. So this is just about some stress analysis. 
Just to give me an idea of the room, how many of you guys use Fusion 360 at the moment? Not a few of you, how many of you use Inventor? Okay, SolidWorks, anything else like that? Okay, well, as you know, you can, you can import your models into Fusion, we forgive you. Um, <laughs> So the workflows that we're going to show inside of, of, of Fusion are actually very similar inside of Inventor as well. So a lot of the same principles apply around meshing and uh, loads and constraints. All right. So I'm going to hand back over to Nigel. Uh, this is probably a typical um, mooring component that we would use. It it's basically joins two ropes together. It's got two eyes. It works in tension. There's two cheap plates on the top, and there's two spools in between the ropes as well. Uh, typically these can go anything from 100 tonnes load up to about 600 tonne loads and uh, this one I think we're going to represent will just be a 100 tonne load onto the, onto the components. The most important things for us of course is once you deploy these things out in the sea we need to reduce the mass because every time these are dropped into the ocean off the back of service vehicles it's all about time and money as well and of course a lot of these materials are very expensive because they have to be corrosion resistant to uh, the seawater and so forth. So it's very important that we consider the materials that we use in these simulations. Um, start off at the, uh, the best place with a mug of tea and a sheet of paper and you scratch out your calculations, your hand calculations. So you've got a rough idea of what you're looking for um, when the simulation's finished and you're not looking at the screen thinking, yeah, that works, but actually you're a million miles out on where your stresses should be. Right, cool. So what Nigel and I did was look at running some simulations to think about uh, lightweighting this component. So the little animation you're seeing there is actually some uh, shape generation, which we'll get to a little bit later. But what we're looking at here is lightweighting the cheek plates and the rollers to see if we can reduce the overall mass of this component, because obviously we want to get them as light as possible. So the first sort of consideration was materials. And um, do you want to jump into these? Do you want me to go? Yeah, okay. So the first material is called Orcot TLMM, which I bet no one in the room's ever heard of. Any takers? No? Okay. So it's a composite material, very sort of similar material properties to nylon uh, in terms of low swell in seawater, uh, really nice and hard wearing. And it's, um, it's sort of wound, am I correct in saying so, that? Yeah, it's a wound laminate structure. Yeah, stick, stick close. Okay. Um, and then we're using a stainless steel called super duplex stainless steel, which just has really high um, yield strength. So you'll see that its yield is 240 megapascals. But if you look slightly higher up in that table at, say, normal steel, you'll see that you have 205 megapascals. So it's, it's really hard wearing and it's corrosion resistant. So really good materials for this application. Obviously, we want to use the TLMM on the uh, spools and the super duplex stainless steel on the, um, the cheek plates. Originally, everything was made out of the super duplex stainless steel. All right, say that? Yeah. There we go. Okay. So a bit of an understanding of Fusion 360. Uh, I'm not going to bore you to death with meshing theory and Hooke's law and all sorts of things, but just to give you an idea, um, who's seen an FEA before? Yeah. Who's run an FEA before? Who understands what a mesh is? Who doesn't understand what a mesh is? Oh, that's easy. I'll just skip through this. Okay. So just as a quick idea, um, in, in 2D, the idea of a mesh is that we take the overall area, we divide it up into smaller segments so that we can mathematically calculate how the force is distributed through the shape. In 3D, what we do is we use, or Fusion uses, uh, tetrahedrons, which are six-sided triangular shapes, and that mesh is then applied to the model. Now, there's three different types that Fusion deploys. So the first is just a very simple four node version. We then have a parabolic version, which is 10 nodes. Uh, and that just adds additional points to the, to the mesh. And it helps add a little bit of accuracy to your model. So you've got more points to analyze. And then slightly more complex are curved um, tetrahedrals. Now, you don't really have to worry about this. They are in the mesh settings inside of the software. The software looks after all of it for you but I thought it would be worth mentioning. And obviously in 3D, um, that image there just shows how these tetrahedras uh, join up to, for, to fill in a form. All right, so if we look at mesh settings, you'll see that to get to the curved mesh elements, uh, we have 
parabolic settings and a little tick box over there, uh, which allows you to add curved mesh elements. And I'll show you where this has been quite useful in uh, the presentation. All right, so if we then move on from the mesh, every single simulation we create has three main inputs, and those are materials, constraints, and loads. Um, and now the nice thing about the software is that the tools are laid out from left to right. So you work from the left pretty much through to the right within reason, going materials, constraints, loads, etc., etc. So if we look at our materials, we go and apply material. That's not gone off on there. Okay, it doesn't matter. Um, and effectively what happens is if you forget to apply material to your model, Fusion defaults you to steel, which is a good start point. Um, you can have a different material on your model to the material in your simulation, which is quite handy. So you might run a simulation in, in mild steel uh, and then decide, well, now I need to do one in stainless steel. And you can just copy your simulation over and swap out the simulation material as opposed to the actual physical material. And you can see how your simulations run from there. So in this example here, you can see on the left-hand side, we've got, um, if you look at the bottom one, the material is steel, but it's been changed out for super duplex stainless. And up the top, we've got TLMM, and we're going same as model. OK. We then need to apply constraints. So if we think of this glass, we know that it's made out of glass. And this glass is sitting on top of a surface. So we need to apply some constraints. So obviously, the things acting on this are gravity. And it's got a frictionless constraint with this surface. Now, obviously, it's not a frictionless constraint, because in real life, you can hear it dragging a little bit. But in a simulation, we pretty much set that as frictionless, because within reason, it's relatively frictionless. So move on to our constraints. And we can choose a set of constraints. So give me a little bit of detail on the handouts. Obviously, a fixed constraint stops movement. You can free up certain directions. Frictionless constraints uh, literally allow that movement. Uh, pin constraints are applied to shafts and to holes to hold things in that sort of uh, orientation. And we can use prescribed displacement as well. So if you're going to build something that needs to clip into something else, you know that I've got to move it three millimeters for the clip to go through. You can actually apply that three millimeter um, prescribed displacement to the component and then see what the stresses are on the part. Importantly, frictionless constraints can be used to simulate symmetry. There's no symmetry button inside of Fusion 360, um, but we'll show you how to apply that later on as we go through an example. So moving on to the next thing is obviously to apply loads. Um, there are loads of loads, excuse the bad pun. Uh, we can apply forces, pressures, bearing loads, moments, remote forces, and gravity. If you're, com if you're simulating smallish components, you don't really have to worry about gravity. But if something has got to sort of be self-weighted, so if you're doing something like this building structure and you wanted to make sure that your uh, beams and columns were all going to sort of stand up on their own, gravity might be a good thing to add to your simulation. Um, we're going to be looking at bearing loads mainly in in the simulations I'm going to show you, but for the most part, you'll probably be applying forces or pressures to most things that you generally come across, uh, particularly as you're starting out using uh, simulation. Um, obviously, we can apply structural loads from that drop down. So the next thing along, and this is the tricky bit where you might get caught out, or I do, probably because I'm an Inventor user uh, normally, uh, is that you've got to generate your contacts, and they tend to all be bonded. So you've actually got to go back in and click on Manage Contacts to get to your contacts to set up the default contacts you want between different bodies. So to give you an example, this is a simulation we already set up, and we'll look at this in a sec. But if you go into the um, Manage Contacts area, I can see the two components there. And I just want to make sure that I change them from being bonded to being uh, sliding, so I can actually see that these components will work. And the reason for that is obviously the spool will actually move around that pin. Does that make any sense so far? Yeah, everyone's still awake? Excellent. All right, so go into mesh settings. I'm not going to read through all of this. This is just a screenshot out of the help. Uh, it's quite useful, though. So if we go into our, um, our mesh settings or adaptive mesh refinement, we can choose how many refinements we want to run, and we can sort of influence how our model's going to refine itself. So what am I on about? Um, if we start up the top, you can see the, see if the mouse comes up on that screen. Yeah. All right, cool. So you'll see the maximum number of, of refinements we've said there is seven. So effectively what we're doing is we're telling the software, run through my simulation for me and run up to seven refinements on my mesh. So what we're saying is when there's a high concentration of stress in that area, all right, in the area we're looking at, 
is further down uh, is we're saying five percent in the area of the top five percent of stress we want you to refine that mesh for me in that area so it'll run it'll run a simulation once and the next time it'll run through the second time and it'll it'll uh, go through those five percent and it'll make the mesh finer in that area and in this setting which is quite ambitious to start it'll do that seven times now that can be quite time consuming but it will mean that you have a more accurate um, simulation in the end all right so once we've run our simulation, we then have to interpret whether or not we're anywhere near to being accurate. So if you take some of the things Nigel started with around having a hand calculation or having an understanding of things, um, hopefully you'll be designing components that you're relatively familiar with. So if, you, if you've created a simulation and the component's moving in the wrong direction or it seems to be breaking in the wrong direction or the stress just seems to be in the wrong place, you probably need to consider your constraints or your loads and just think back to what's actually realistic. Um, so always have a look at, you know, are the results what I expected? When you look at your simulation, make sure that your simulation, uh, you look at it with actual deformation because the images you see after a simulation are adjusted just to give you an idea of where things are moving. But if you're interested in actually understanding how much it is, always go for an actual deformation. I'll show you that in a little bit. Uh, where are the high stresses happening? Are there any stress singularities? We'll run through those in a sec as well. And what does a convergence plot look like? So I spoke about those mesh settings and those refinements. The police have found me. Um, the idea is that as your results are run, so let's say we've run those five or six different mesh uh, uh, refinements, convergence basically gets us to a point where there's less and less difference between those refinements, which means that our results are more accurate. Right, which I'll get onto in the next slide. So effectively inside here, um, you set a mesh convergence that you're happy with. And the idea is that when the difference between those slight vari or those different mesh refinements becomes insignificant or within two or 3%, you've reached the convergence and your results are gonna be relatively accurate. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah, good. All right, so stress singularities happen. You'll, you'll look at your model and there'll just be an area where there's massively high stress and it doesn't seem logical. Normally they're on sharp points or corners um, and the idea is that FEA is using this theory of elasticity, so force divided by area. If you've got a very small area, like a point, if you divide something by zero, you get this infinitely crazy number. So you get this black hole of stress. I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat and show you a video quickly. Hey everyone, this is Aaron. This week we're gonna be looking at a quick tip related to simulation. So this is a pretty classical representation of uh, what we refer to as a singularity. Take a look at the convergence plot. This is a telltale sign that you have a singularity. The stress just continues to rise as you refine the mesh. An easy way to deal with this in some cases is to just add a fill. This is going to change the singularity to now what's called a stress concentration. And if we take a look at that convergence graph once again, you're going to see that it does eventually top out. And that's what you should take as your final value for the stress in that case. Now, real world situations, like we're looking at a fork from a dirt bike here, you can't always just have to fill it to deal with it, right? So sometimes you need to just learn how to interpret the data and sort through and figure out you know, what values are, are applicable and which ones are caused by this phenomenon. Change now to the convergence plot, you're gonna see how this continues to rise up and up. Uh, if we take a look at the stress plot, the same coloration is all throughout this assembly. So it, it's telling me, you know, there's a very high stress value somewhere we use the scaling here to sort through, you'll see this area where this very high stress is. So how do we deal with this in this case? Well, you can actually learn to ignore those areas where these high stress values are just off the charts. Uh, the elements one or two away from that location should be accurate to the stress values for this assembly. So no, you don't have to go and add fillets every time you have a, a singularity. It is something that is unavoidable in some cases. And Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into a little bit of detail about that in a second. Um, I'm just gonna quickly run through how we generate a simulation working left to right, and then we're gonna do one in real life as well. So we, we're gonna go and choose our simulation type. And remember, we're moving left to right along the top here. So we're gonna go and apply a material first. So in this example, I'm gonna go and apply a, um, a material overload to the steel, as we sort of saw earlier. Um, so we're putting in the super duplex stainless. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna apply some constraints. So we're gonna fix the pin, we then apply loads. So in this example, we're gonna go through and apply a, um, a bearing load to that face we've chosen over there. And the load is 100 kilonewtons. 
And once we've done that, we need to go through, obviously we work left to right, we're gonna go through into our contacts and we're gonna go and generate our contacts. You can set a, um, a tolerance as well. And once we've done that, we can then go and look at our managed area and we can go and change this from bonded to sliding. Once we've done that, we run through and we hit solve. And we can then choose to solve these locally or on the cloud. So that's the beauty of Fusion is we can actually solve these on the cloud using cloud credits as opposed to solving them locally. And then we get a set of results. All right. So when I started looking at the weight reduction on the roller, um, my first simulation didn't go very well. Started out by fixing the two ends of the pin. Um, obviously we applied the materials we needed and um, applied the load and set up my sliding contact. So I fixed the two ends of the pin thinking that that was the most logical thing to do. Applied our bearing load to the face shown over there and ran the first simulation and I got a stress singularity at the top of the pin. A safety factor of 0.83% and um, my convergence plot was sort of at 8%. So I thought, okay, let's run another simulation. Now I could have ignored that singularity up there because it's not actually of any consequence to the uh, spool itself. So what I did was I went in and I ran this again, but I refined the mesh on the end of the pin, hoping to uh, make my problem go away, and uh, it got slightly worse. So back to the drawing board. No problem. Um, went in and thought, well, actually, if we fix the pin, so the pin can't go anywhere, it's made out of a much harder material than the, uh, the spool. Uh, we can use that to run our simulation. And this fixed the problem. So what happened here was that our convergence rate came down. It was at 2.8%, uh, which is great. Uh, our safety factor was good. And just that small change to the way I approached the simulation solved the problem. So you're gonna get yourself into situations occasionally where you're gonna run something, it's gonna not do what you want, and you might have to try a few different things. And don't be afraid to experiment because it's just a PC running in the background or you're sending something to the cloud. Do lots of different iterations and try things to try and get around any problems you come up against. All right, so what does the stress singularity look like? In this example here, you can see I've got a 121 megapascal um, uh, sort of hotspot in the middle of the roller there. And you'll notice that that singularity or that, that stress concentration is just on a few small elements. And as we move just off, off of those elements by one or two elements out, that stress dissipates. So we don't really have anything to worry about there. We can sort of take the stress load just next to that as the result. Okay. So how did I get around the stress singularity in this specific example? Well, the first thing I did is I used curved mesh elements. We're doing something round over here, so it actually makes sense to use the curved mesh elements. They fit into the geometry better. Obviously, that'll uh, take slightly longer to run, but that's okay. Um, and I went in and I said, look, run me five mesh refinements and refine the top 20% of my problem. So off it went, and it ran this for me, and I got a, a big reduction here. So you see on the left-hand side, we started out with 121 megapascals of maximum stress. After we've adjusted the mesh, that's come down to 65, which is great. Um, and looking at the material, the compressive strength of this material is around 90 megapascals. So 65 into 90, we're okay. We're not gonna have any trouble. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. All right, so on the spool itself, we've obviously got the um, original, which was made out of the super duplex stainless steel, and it weighed 8.1 kilos. We've gotten that down to 1.3 kilograms. So it's a mass reduction of 6.8 kgs or 13.6 kilos per connector. Now that's half a Backstreet Boy, that's quite a bit of mass. It's a tough crowd. <laughs> well, I'll pass over to Nigel. <laughs> and, uh, this is just simply how the, um, the material looks when it's machined up and manufactured. As you can see, it's a composite laminate um, with a solid lubricant built inside as well and a resin base. So these are very easy to machine once we've got this far, but also very expensive as well. So it's really important that we get the FVA in the right area we are before we go to manufacture and start to make these components. All right, so the next part of this was obviously to reduce mass on the cheek plates. So Nigel actually did a bunch of hand calcs and figured that um, as long as the sort of midsection was down to, I think it was 143 millimeters, um, it should be okay. Um, we ran a preliminary uh, shape optimization as well, and it actually told us the same thing that the hand calcs did, so that's fantastic. And the idea is that we'd move to a design that looks like the one you see on the right over there. So one of the benefits of moving to that design is obviously mass reduction, uh, which is great, but we could also nest these together um, 
and by nesting them, we end up with material optimization. So we get sort of a 33% increase in material usage. Um, excitingly, if you watch Steve Hooper this morning, they're actually looking at bringing this into Fusion itself. Uh, the nesting you're seeing there was not done in Fusion at all, but you know, just to give you an idea. So think about things like that as well around material optimization. All right, so this is the shape optimization after it was run. Uh, obviously, we're not going to talk about it in too much detail, but basically you can see the material we don't need um, in those areas there, and we could have gone through a bit more of that green into the yellow uh, to get to our end result. Okay, so we're going to look at the cheat plates analysis uh, in a sec. Just to make this more interesting, we've run some symmetry through it. So if you see the sketch I've done on the right hand side, I've sort of drawn some symmetrical planes through it. And the idea is that we're going to chop our model into a quarter. But there's a few things you need to watch out for when you work in symmetry because you can get caught out. So, oh, I need to click on that. All right, so we start out, I've chopped the model into a quarter. And from here, we're going to go into the simulation workspace. So we're going to go up the top, tell it to run us a simulation. And I'm going to create a new simulation, and it's going to be a static stress. Now, from here, I'm going to click on materials, and I've got a few too many components inside of there. So what you've got to remember is that there's another pin and another spool that we can't see. So I'm just going to go and suppress those so that they're not part of my simulation. So once those are gone, I can then go in and have a look at um, running our simulation. So I'm just going to hide those very quick. OK. So when we shoot into materials now, you'll see that we've just got two cheek plates, a pin and a, and a spool, which is excellent. So I can now go and grab multi-select these. I'm just going to set them all to Super Duplex Stainless Steel. And then I'm going to go back into the roller individually and set that to TLMM. So just a little bit of a, a speed optimization there. So my materials are set. I'm happy. Next thing along, I'm going to go and add some constraints. Now, we're fixing the two ends. And then we're going to apply a frictionless constraint to all of the faces. So I'm going to apply a frictionless constraint to the, um, to the roller. That's going to infer symmetry effectively. And then I'm going to do the same thing on the pin. And then I'm going to do the same thing on each of the faces of the cheek plates. I like applying these separately because when you run out of report or if you want to change something later, you've got a bit more control if you change your mind. Um, and your elements are sort of looked after quite well. So those are now uh, applied. And we can then apply our load. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to apply a bearing load onto that face over there. So we're going to choose bearing load. And there's some nice little helpers here. I actually make a mistake here. I'm on degrees and I'm putting in a, a 50 kilonewton load. Again, I've halved the load now because I've got half the model. Um, correct that, put it in the X direction, and off we go. Right, so we've applied our materials, our constraints, and our loads. Um, I've then decided to go and have a quick look at the mesh settings. So I've got into the mesh settings and I've said, well, actually, I'd like to go and create curved uh, elements. And I then shoot into the adaptive. And I go and set some settings in here, which are insignificant at this stage, really, because I'm going to make some changes later anyway. So we go and make these small adjustments to our mesh settings. All right. At this stage, I go and hit solve. But I've forgotten to, um, I've forgotten to go and look at my contacts. So the software actually tells me, you don't have contacts in there. So I'm just going to go back in a second, generate my contacts. And once you've generated those, this is the thing to think about is that they're going to be bonded. So you've got to go back and set them to sliding. So we've gone back in, manage contacts. We're going to go and change those back to sliding. OK. So now everything can move as we'd expect. And then I'm going to run my simulation. These ones are going to run locally. And thanks to the magic of television, I've sped up the simulation speed by 10 times, so don't expect that performance. Uh, that would be magical, but no. Um, right, so we get a uh, safety factor of 3.8, which sounds fantastic. We're going to have a look at the stress. We've got a maximum stress of uh, 65 megapascals. So on the surface of this, that seems great. It looks like we've got a good result. But our convergence plot is horrible. You know, we're at 26%, and um, the convergence was going up. So I've gone back in. And I've done a mesh refinement again. And let's move that along. So the next idea was to actually go and reduce the overall element size. So you can see now that um, if you look at the image there, I've got a really nice tight mesh. It's looking quite good. I've reduced the element size. I've rerun the simulation. And um, my convergence is now at 1.1%. 
it's a bit better. The maximum stress has come down from 45 megapascals, so I'm not too worried about it. And that, um, that high stress is on um, the corner of this component, so you'll see that in a second. Um, so if I drag the sliders here, you'll see that the high stress is on the top corner of that cheek plate. Okay, so again, this is very much a stress singularity. It's nothing to worry about. If we go and look at that element, you'll see it's actually on an element and it's not really gonna go anywhere. Uh, all right, um, how are we doing for time? Ah, oh, loads of time, excellent, right. So what I'll do is I'm just gonna jump into the product quickly just to give you an idea. I can't jump into the product, do I don't have it on yet? Ah, we'll run it off of here. Okay, so from from Fusion, you can run reports um, quite easily. It's just a simple report button. You can upload your company's image. Uh, you can put in a little summary as well. And you save this out as an HTML file. Um, HTML file will run inside of uh, a web browser. You can set the width of your images and you can run through what it looks like. So you'll see my fixed constraints on the end there. And then you see all of my um, frictionless constraints, which I've used for symmetry. So by setting them up individually, I've got a really nice view in my report. And then it goes through and shows me my results summary. Being HTML, it's a little difficult to edit, but if you open it up in Word, you should be able to add a few things to it. And you can add a summary at the beginning of, uh, of the image. Or if you want to build your own report, you've actually got a nice set of images you, you can pull out and use yourself. All right, so if we look at the overall results from the cheek plates themselves, um, you know, before versus after. Uh, the original design was 17.3 kilos. Um, once we got to the dog bone, we were down at 15.4. So that's saving us just shy of two kilos per cheek plate, um, which gets us down to 17.4 percent, uh, 17.4 kilo overall saving on, on the entire design, which is, um, is quite significant, I'd say. Yeah. Well, I'll click for you. There we go. From, um, from our initial design and RFA report then, we actually go to manufacture now. We're saying these are quite large pieces of steel which we're cutting. But a lot of manufacturing goes into these. And then we take them over to our test house and uh, actually test them in a real world situation before we deliver them to the customer as well. As you can see in the uh, next slide, these components are particularly large. so. You don't really want to go making too many mistakes before you get to, to manufacture because it's going to be an awful long road back to uh, getting where you were before. You're looking at about 12 to 16 week lead time for some of these products. But these were now ready to go and be shipped out to, um, in this case, these were uh, shipped out to Samsung in Korea, as you can see in the next slide. And they're then assembled on site and then hauled up onto the top of the rig. And again, with the next slide, as you can see, that's probably a, a, gives you a good indication of the actual size of the components that we've been working with. Cool. Guys, that's pretty much what we had to talk about. Um, are there any questions? Anyone want to know anything about it? Yeah. again <laughs> okay uh, sometimes I have clients that uh, do some surface treatments for their material so like they might case harden their material so the outer skin is a little bit yeah. harder than the rest um, now in uh, in Astran in, uh, in Fusion in Inventor you can do the stress analysis and it'll be the same but uh, when it comes to the safety factor analysis it won't incorporate the sure. fact that it's been stressed. okay is so there any way that you can do that? There's, there's, two, there's two things you can do, and this is me talking off the cuff. Do some experiments. So yeah. you'll have, there, there's two things you can try. The first thing is if it's, say, a shaft that's been case hardened, you'll have an idea of the overall material properties for, there'll be known sizes effectively. Uh -huh. So you can run a simulation based on that. Now what I would do is I would I'd offset a surface at zero onto the component, apply the, no, you, I'm thinking of chroming. Yeah, so, I've, 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 so on Chrome, for instance, I'd, I'd do something like that. But if it's case hardened, I would just apply the approximate material to it and then do a comparison from there. I was playing with the idea of uh, creating a separate component that was basically the original component, but just a thickened shell around yeah. it. Yeah, so just, just, use, just, use, just use a, a surface offset yeah. at zero millimeters so it's on it as yeah. if it was a coating. That's clever. Yeah. And go from there. Like 
<laughs> cool. Any others? In the back. Yeah, this is not really relevant to future, I think. But you know, in architecture, also we need to do some um, uh, material sheet cutting. Uh -huh. So I saw your slide about getting the most number of units out yes. of the same sheet. Yes. Is that what you did in Fusion? I, we didn't do it in Fusion. That's actually not in the software yet. But yeah. this morning it was announced they're putting it into the software. So that, that technology is called nesting. And what it does is you basically take flat 2D shapes, uh, tell it the size of the material you're going to cut, and it'll then optimize those shapes and sort of put them together on a, on a, on a sheet so that you get the, the biggest material yield. Um, is so it a separate uh, application? That I can it's going it's to be incorporated into Fusion in the yes. near future. But for now, if I can... For now, it. the way I did that was in AutoCAD, manually moving things around. Really? Uh, yeah. So that image was from AutoCAD? Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there are. So, I mean, Autodesk sell um, some fabrication products that do it. There, there are other apps available, but it, it will be coming into Fusion, so you, you'll have access to it if you've got Fusion. Even if it's an app, do you know something we can test right now? Yeah, so the, there's a, a whole suite of fabrication products from Autodesk, and it's nesting is included in that uh, from an Autodesk point of view. There are other vendors that, that do nesting as well, but from an Autodesk point of view, uh, fabrication tools will have that. If you, I'll give you my card afterwards and I'll, I can yeah. help you with that, that's no problem. Yeah. Thank you. You don't have a question? Yeah. Ah, cool. Yeah, so actually that, that, that's a good point. There's, there's, um, there's another tool called Exact Flat that does flat patterning and they, they actually do some nesting as well. Uh, so there, there are some, some bits and bobs you can find on that. Yeah, yes. At what point do you start to need to go to nonlinear? Okay, so that depends on the application. What is this thing made out of? So, so just, just say steel, like a steel component. If, would you ever, if you only care about the yield, um, would you ever need to go to nonlinear? It depends. How far am I pushing it? How thick is the material? Yeah. What is the application? Is it is it under pressure? Hmm. Say that it's like a like a maybe a frame or something. So skinny. Okay, am I going to be dropping things on the frame? Is the frame going to be sat on the floor? So I if, suppose it could have been pulse loading, yeah. Yeah, so if, if it's something that's going to be picked up and moved and yeah. dropped, I would then think of something nonlinear. Okay. Um, if it's just a frame that we're going to yep. pile boxes on top of, yep. static's fine. Okay. Um, so that, that would be my thought process behind that. Hey, sorry, one more. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you've got prescribed displacement. I've never yep. actually used that one. Does it um, gradually place, uh, like so say you put 10 millimeters prescribed uh -huh. displacement, does it say over the course of uh, a second? Uh, I'm going to be totally honest with you, I've not used it inside of Fusion. Um, I've only used it in Inventor, but the, the theory is that, you know, you, what, what would the stress look like if I did push that component yeah. in? Uh, the, the exact time frame for that I'm, I'm not familiar with, I don't think. No? If you, uh, no. if you had it instantly displaced, the stress Obviously, would be insane, yeah. Sure, but I mean, that, that would happen with all stress, so it, it is gradually yeah. applied to the yeah. model. All right, cool. Thank cool. You. Any others? Oh, cool. Well, guys, that's it. Thank you so much for your attention and staying awake. Thank you.